Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Firstly, many thanks to Jean Luca for warming you all up as we now embark on a discussion on image rights. Um, my name is Matt Bloomford. I'm an associate in the sports group of Maples and Calder. It's my pleasure you, to welcome you all to the Maples panel session on image rights. Winston Churchill once said, a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, an optimist sees the opportunity in every difficulty. In our discussions this afternoon, we are going to explore the commercial opportunities associated with image rights and the perceived difficulties in realizing and maximizing their value. We hope that whether you're a, a club, a player, an agent or a commercial partner, you'll leave this room with fresh optimism for the future and new ideas to explore when you return to the office. So uh, without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce you to our special ones. Starting from the far right, we have Andrew Dart. Andy is an image rights expert. He recently set up his own company, having left his role as head of commercial partnerships at Chelsea Football Club, where he oversaw the club's acquisition of their players' image rights and their commercial exploitation. Sitting next to Andy is Fraser Reed. Fraser is a partner at Couchman's, the leading sports business law firm. He specialized in advising talent and their agents and management companies in the world of sports. Next to Fraser is Freddie Huxtable. Freddie is a private client tax partner at Baker Tilly. Having worked with music business clients, golf, tennis, and Formula One personalities, Freddie's primary focus since 1999 has been advising international professional footballers on image rights and wealth planning. And last, but by no means least, we have Simon Firth. Simon is the co-head of the sports media and entertainment group at Mabels and Calder. He has extensive experience advising owners, sports bodies, athletes and broadcasters on all aspects of sports related transactions, including athlete wealth management structures and the ownership and licensing of image rights. Now, before we kick off, I'd just like to do a very brief bit of housekeeping. Um, there will be a opportunity at the end to ask any questions. Um, we only have a relatively short amount of time, so if you do have any questions on image rights, please do bear them in mind and we will do our best to answer them at the end of the session. So to get started, to bring us all onto the same page, we all have a notion of what image rights are, but what do we actually mean when we talk about image rights in the football context? And I'm going to ask Fraser perhaps to lead a discussion on what we, what we really mean by this concept. Thanks, Matt. Um, can you hear me, everybody? Is this, can you all hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, image rights is the sort of industry term used effectively for a player footballer's commercial rights. So it's the hodgepodge of rights connected with a player on the commercial side, so his name, likeness, image, and the right for someone to use that in a commercial context. So we divide normally image rights into two types. One is passive rights, and that's the right to use a name, image, or likeness, and into active rights, which is the right to uh, use a player, a footballer, for promotional uh, appearances, etc. Now, uh, Image rights have been about in the industry now for probably 20 so years or longer, but in about the uh, two th year 2000, the Premier League here in England, they introduced some standard Clause 4 rights. So in the Premier League contract, the club is given what are called some rights under Clause 4 to use the player in uh, his image rights in a club context. So a standard football relationship will be the player can be uh, obliged to provide certain obligations to the club under Clause 4. Now what's happened as uh, football has developed its profile, etc., and players' profile have developed as well, is now you see some real value in image rights. So as a result, you find now with certain players, there is a separate image rights contract as well as a playing contract. Now that is done normally where the, the club is paying additional money for additional rights over and above the Clause 4 rights or is renegotiating some of the Clause 4 rights. And particularly now, I think we're seeing due to financial fair play and clubs are now beefing up their commercial departments, they see real value in image rights. So as a result, when you have a negotiation with a player who's joining a club, there's also quite a detailed negotiation in relation to the player's image rights and the ability of the club to use those rights for the benefit of themselves and their own commercial partners. And I think we were talking beforehand how, how much this has evolved, really, because in my own experience, uh, you know, 10 years ago, when you were negotiating an image rights contract for a player, 
it probably was only about maybe one or two pages long, if that. But now, particularly with the bigger clubs, you may have image rights contracts up to 30 or 40 pages long, dealing with the detail and the rights and restrictions uh, involved with the use of the player's image rights by the club. And the, the, the big area really is in terms of what rights the club has and what individual rights the player has to be able to do his own personal deals. And obviously the club's concern is they don't conflict with their own commercial partners. So this has become quite an area of, um, uh, of interest and obviously of value to both players and clubs alike. Thank and you. now forms an important part of the negotiation. Thank you, Fred. Just pause there. You obviously mentioned uh, commercial rights and how they've evolved over the years. Perhaps, um, Freddie, I know you've been in the, in the game a little while now without giving the game away completely, but could you perhaps bring us up to speed with how um, image rights were used initially as a, to get money, to bring monetary value to the table, and how perhaps they've evolved into something else and what they, that encompasses in today's market? Yeah, uh, thanks, Matt. I, I think um, if someone wants to correct me in the audience, then please go ahead, but I think where you first saw image rights, if you go back in time, is probably in the US and the developing in other sports, such as golf and tennis uh, and areas like that, more where there's a sort of a, something akin to a self-employment and maybe where the business management in the States was a little bit more active in generating deals for sports personalities. And in many ways, football was quite low profile until the Premier League uh, came to the fore in the, in the 90s. Um, if you go back to uh, the 60s and you think of a player like uh, George Best, um, I saw a bit of the previous presentation, which is why he comes to mind. I mean, there's a classic image there, isn't there? Um, okay, it went off a bit in the end, but there was no exploitation of his image in those days. It just wasn't even thought about. Whereas now, I think possibly, like I say, driven by the more commercially minded people originally in the US, agents here and internationally have picked up on the concept of their players being a valu valuable commodity over and above what they do on the pitch, maybe the, what they do on the pitch enhances the opportunities with commercial um, organizations, whether that's the club and using the player as an icon within the club or beyond that. So you naturally see that development where it comes into the Premier League um, probably in the late 90s. And in addition to that, you know, the drive for clubs to raise more commercial revenue, whether it's for financial fair play or just to be able to compete off the pitch in terms of their income that they receive and then spend it on player wages, that's where image rights have come to the fore in a club context but have been more focused in relation to the individual players. So can we drill down on some of the details? So what were you seeing to start with in terms of what rights were being um, put or made subject to contracts and some of the more sort of at the other end of the spectrum, what we're seeing now? Well, I, I think in the early days, you'd have a situation like, let's do an image rights contract. No one really knew what that meant. And people would just set up a company and money would flow into the company. Now, for any of you involved in it today, I mean, it, it, in a sense, it's much more professional, it's much more organized in that you identify what the rights are, you have all the paperwork to support that. Because not the least of which, we've got the inland revenue looking over our shoulders to make sure we do everything properly and we'll probably try and tax us if we don't do it right. So I think, um, to pick up on Fraser's point, you have a couple of pages in a document, what, 10 years or so ago. Now you've got much more considered documents. Each clause is well negotiated apart from the standard boilerplates so that where you're getting clubs making sure they're getting the exact rights that they want, they're stopping players going off and doing their own deals in certain areas that may conflict with club rights. So you do need that team of people around to fully understand what this bundle of rights is all about. And of course, within the UK, not speaking as a lawyer, but as a layman in that regard, there's no such thing as, a, as an image rights, a Roman image right per se. It's a bundle of rights. So that's what you've got to be sort of careful about and aware of. And that's in the, in the UK. What about internationally? And what we're seeing perhaps outside the UK? Simon, can you perhaps elaborate on some of the things that you're, you're seeing elsewhere? Certainly. Um, Going back to um, what Fraser said originally, the, 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 the original two-page contract was basically uh, a, a negotiation by um, agents and players to seek revenue for um, the non-playing work they did for a club. And, and originally that, that came with some resistance. Um, nowadays it's, it, it's, it's almost 180 degrees where, um, and certainly on the international um, uh, 
outside of the Premiership, certainly. Um, what we're seeing is um, clubs are actually looking for an interest in the player's image rights um, separate to what he does for the club. So, so the player's own sponsorship deals are becoming part of what the clubs want um, a, a part in. Um, and so we're, we're seeing that um, as, a, as a development um, on the international scale, um, more so in, in the other leagues than we are in the Premiership. But that, I think that's an evolution that we're going to see through into the Premiership uh, soon. So what, what I'm hearing at the moment is there's very two distinct interest groups. You've got club and you've got player. So where are the commercial uh, sort of opportunities in image rights today? Um, perhaps taking the club perspective first. So pa Andy, could you yeah. perhaps give us an insight sure. of how yeah. people should... Good evening, everyone. Yeah, um, I think probably going the, the evolution piece is that the, the first guise of image rights was this whole thing of Clause 4, which is a very basic, you get a certain amount of time for PR, a certain amount of time for commercial partnerships, and then the ability to the licensing sell shirts and things you'd generally see in the mega store. And I think, you know, at that point, the clubs were very, very short staffed. Um, I remember starting, we had a commercial director, a head of sponsorship, and these contracts were negotiated by chief exec, uh, financial director, and um, external lawyers. And so it was kind of passed down the chain. Um, and what you see now is, you know, with, with FFP and with clubs having to monetize every single area of the business that they can. Um, you know, you've got a stadium that's a certain size, you've got broadcasting revenue um, that's a certain you know, amount, and you've got your um, uh, ticketing and hospitality you can go to far, but so where are the other areas of growth, the commercial areas, and you know, so for clubs, you know, where is that going to take you? It's going to take you to the players, which is potentially your most valuable asset. And so, you know, you're going beyond just licensing. You're starting to see that, you know, obviously they, they pick up deals on the international um, stage. And the most valuable area for individuals is generally around the international tournaments. So, you know, it enhances this sort of clause four for the club to be able to then start, you know, uh, making money, say, for a Brazilian around a Brazilian World Cup or for an African around the African Cup of Nations or, you know, and perhaps there's um, Asian opportunities in, in access in Asia or on tours or on other areas. So, you know, it, it brings in that kind of individual context so that you're, you know, you're, you're in the, the clubs are beginning to benefit from the Pepsi board deals or from the, you know, the other arrangements, EA Sports or whatever that, that historically have always been around um, the, uh, the, the, the players and maybe not so much the clubs. Um, you know, the, there's also that area now that's starting to enhance um, club sponsor agreements and getting the players to perform more under their um, uh, club commercial partners. I think Liverpool have done some stuff with Nivea recently where you're seeing the players kind of in a slightly different context, which you know you wouldn't have seen previously. Um, you know, there's uh, potentially, as I mentioned, about opening up other markets. So you know, if you've got an African player, you're going to start trying to push in that market or you know uh, another area. Um, you know, so, uh, there's also the other areas that the, the players coming in potentially could be aligned with a one-man band and, uh, you know, an individual agent. And so, you know, the clubs now have got resources in Asia. Um, they could be have other areas. So, you know, you're, you're having to enhance the, uh, the, the work which the agent does and, and support what they're doing. So, you know, these other offices are beginning to deliver more commercial revenue and sort of tap into, you know, local markets. And that's a, um, I think there's also young players you know there's potential around these guys get them young so you're not paying as much for the, the image rights and see them in advance and getting working with them and building that relationship with the players as they develop into a first team player um you know other areas which probably will start going you're seeing teams touring more so maybe there's more individual access on individual tours so that fans in other markets can see players um in the flesh and not just see it on tv you know so you may see off-season trips um, and another area which I think is still, you know, uh, developing is this whole content, what is engaging content, what is the value of content, and where does the line start between what is individual content and what is club rights. So, you know, they start talking about a, a match, which is a, a team match, or are they talking about their own personal life and having a, you know, a coffee in the morning as they, as they get up. So, you know, there's a, there's a whole host of areas that now these agreements are beginning to move into far beyond clause four and start wrapping all of these rights, which, you know, the, uh, are part of a new 30, 40 page image rights agreement. So without giving away sort of trade secrets, do you think uh, clubs should be doing anything in particular to view or get the most out of the commercial opportunities associated with image rights? 
Well, I mean, the, the key thing for the club is securing rights that are valuable. Um, you know, I think in the early days, you know, the savvy agents were cutting out their home markets, were, you know, sort of securing uh, certain categories or doing things which they knew were obvious um, uh, targets for endorsements. You know, you'll see boot categories, you see sports drinks or games or other things, and they were trying to ring fence that. So I think the club's getting valuable commercial rights and then having the resource to go out and exploit it because at the end of the day it's one thing having a contract but you actually need to go out and exploit it and uh, take it to market so you can commercialize okay so we've now heard from about the club perspective what about the player perspective and how they should be seeing image rights in the most commercially um, um, i think the 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 common a common mistake for agents of players is sometimes they enter into image rights arrangements and don't appreciate the rights that they've ceded and you can be in a situation sort of six months a year down the line and suddenly realize that you can't actually do a deal in that sector because actually you've actually agreed that you cannot do a deal in the sectors of all the club partners and some clubs you know they can have up to 20 10 20 commercial partners which wipes out most of the main product sectors so i think uh, players and agents have to be increasingly um, aware to this and when they enter into negotiations actually the clubs want these rights now and even though they're getting a commercial fee they have to work out is that commercial fee justified in terms of the revenues they're going to seed in return and I've seen you know a few times the fact that actually the revenues they've received does not compensate for the monies they could have earned individually so I think that's an increasing trend to be careful of. So that it sounds like as well there's a, a little bit of tension now between player and club do you see any issues around this tension? Or no, it's, not, it's, not, it's not tension. I just think it's the, the fact is, as I think Andy and Freddie alluded to, is that image rights are valuable. You know, players, high profile, particularly the, the, the leading players, sponsors want a piece of them. They want to promote their, their brand. And, you know, the, the clubs with FFP want to boost up their commercial revenues. You know, M Manchester United and Man City cases in point. And so they want to get these rights. And they don't want their star players entering into competing deals with their sponsors. I think so there's also a disconnect between um, a situation where you have a sudden transfer or if the, the agent or the people around the player aren't properly advised or thinking about what they're doing, that they just don't think about the detail of the rights. There's a heads of terms that's prepared. And when you come to do a long form uh, license agreement, then things come up that weren't even considered and then that's where you get this disconnect between what the club thinks it's got and what the player or the agent believes they still have to be able to market. Yeah, because a, a lot of times when a deal's done, the, sort of the, the devil's always in the detail and a lot of detail can be very important and uh, sometimes representatives don't quite realise again the detail can lead to sacrificing uh, quite significant revenues. Um, so yeah, it, it, it is, it, it's not a conflict, but it's just a, a contested negotiation over valuable rights. I, I, would add it, I think it's an, an evolution of sophistication on both sides. The clubs are now understanding that there's more value to be made from the players that they're signing from other contracts that are not related to their footballing uh, playing. Um, and the agents and players are understanding that actually there's, there's a revenue source there um, that they need to protect. Uh, as Fraser was saying, some, sometimes they don't always get the most out of that. Um, I think that's again evolving um, to the point that um, both sides fully understand what's at stake and that's leading to 40-page contracts. Um, so what about the future of image rights? Where do you see image rights going? Where do you think the commercial opportunities may be in the future? It's a generally open yeah. question. Perhaps Andy would like to, to yeah, lead on this one. <coughs> well, I, I think the, you know, the, the whole notion is that with clubs and players coming closer together, the opportunity is sort of as a collective more so than trying to individually fight the market and go out on your own because you know the, the, the clubs are much bigger now the reach is there they're the guys who are putting them on the pitch week in week out they're the guys who have got the the, the digital and the media communication teams at the training ground day in day out you know and they've got the sponsor i think um you know there's going to be that sort of uh, finding more creative ways to exploit that and then i guess from the club point of view i mean this this may go slightly against the players in the sense that the club will think they're buying the rights and protecting their their partners and you know there's always that sort of balance in terms of you know you do a uh, if you've got the image rights to a player um and you do a deal with a sponsor you know you are getting a sort of it's effectively a commission on that deal and it's a knockdown commission but as part of 
a, a smaller package, whereas you do a sponsorship deal, you get the whole lot potentially. You know, and it, you know, I mean, that's a bit of a, uh, a very general way of looking at it. But I think you know the the power of the club marks and the, you know the individual and the club kits. You know, you got to be careful of devaluing that. But um, you know, there's definitely uh, uh, you see more. Um, regional partnerships coming out from clubs and you see more access to talent and more adverts going into those markets and I think that slowly sort of detracts from maybe some of the, the individual deals you used to get when you got sort of two three year deals out of Indonesia and Malaysia and Thailand because the guy was a you know a well known Premier League footballer. Okay. And what about pitfalls? We've obviously covered the opportunities. Do you think there's any pitfalls to, to keep an eye out for? Well I, I think um, what you have to watch out for, I mean, image rights and the commercial income derived therefrom, I think is here to stay and can only grow if it's properly used. But one of my mottos is right player, right club. Um, you can't have an image rights contract on an unknown player at an unknown small club. I just don't think that works. And I'm, I think the revenue, if you want to take it to that stage, uh, would actually not, uh, not like that either. I mean, they've issued some guidelines for the Premier League and in a way that's sensible because even the revenue acknowledge that image rights exist they've even got stuff in their inland revenue manuals about image rights and I think the crucial thing there is they know they're not going to go away but it's all about making sure that the structures are set up properly it's all very well to do the commercial deals but you've got to have the infrastructure to go with it and they and the deals have to be commercial they're not a tax device or a tax avoidance device which is why right player, right club has the right ring about it. So if you've got a Chelsea player at Chelsea, which has got a, an image rights department that's looking to develop and build on its global brand, then you have an international player that all seems to fit to me. Then it's just about how much those rights are worth and what that player is going to do to help build that brand. And what about actually allocating a value to the image rights? Is that too difficult a question to ask, or is it a case-by-case -case basis? Is there a rule of thumb? From a commercial point of view, it's what someone will pay. <laughs> exactly. And from an inland you know. revenue valuation point of view, it's a willing buyer, a willing seller in a hypothetical market, which doesn't mean anything to anybody, does it? <laughs> what, the, what, the, what the commercial price is. Yes, yeah. can, can you justify the commercial value? Yeah. That's what it comes down yeah. to. Going back to your question about the future, I think that may resolve itself, because I think one evolution that we, may, we are starting to see, and we, see, we may see more of, is, is players actually taking control of their image rights um, and selling them separately to their contracts to with the, them with the clubs, um, either through a securitization or some other form of, of prepayment for a, a bundle of rights that they have in themselves. Um, and so the market will detect, dictate the price there. Do you think there are any issues with that? Or do you think they'll um, there results. will inevitably be issues with that, um, not least because I think that starts to get us into the interesting third-party ownership discussion again. Um, this isn't pure third-party ownership in terms of what FIFA has legislated against recently, um, but you know you have the potential for some of your star players um, selling, you know, the rights in themselves in the sponsorship deals to a third party who owns them. Um, that third party has no control over a transfer or not, or not part of the transfer negotiation and not part of the, the sale proceeds in terms of the transfer but they are an interested party and therefore they'll want to be around the table so it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Well, thank you very much gentlemen. I'm conscient, conscious that we've talked about quite a few points here so I thought it would make sense to open up to the floor to see if anyone's got any questions and if they'd like to pose anything to our, to our special ones. Is there a microphone in the room? Yes, hello, I'm Rich Oxen from Finnish Football League. Uh, what if there's a situation that a smaller, smaller club and a young player and they don't do any uh, image right contract? Wh how does it uh, work that way? Does the club have a right to use uh, images or, or not? Yeah. Um, yeah, because if it's to take, for example, the Premier League, then in the standard contract there is under Clause 4, the, the, the club is granted these standard rights by the player. So it, without the image rights contract, the club gets these standard rights, club context rights. So you, you don't need an additional image rights contract. Um, and uh, how, how about the league? How about? 
how about the league? How about the Premier League or lower league, say in the Premiership? Does the re league have any rights? Does the league? The league, yes, under the clause four, it yeah. gets it's gets certain rights. Yeah. The players who, who sign the image rights agreement, it's generally those who have assigned their individual rights to a company. So hence you have an image rights agreement. Otherwise, you're just signing a normal playing contract, which has clause four, which has protection for the league partner, protection for the club's principal partners, and, and so on. So it's it's just kind of a, an evolution of that process, really. There's effectively a default position with a, with a pure player contract. And that doesn't stop players going off and doing their own things, like locally opening a... Um, yeah. I don't know, a, a, a stadium or something, or a venue, or yeah. indeed a boot deal, which is the more obvious one, because that, in a sense, is a sort of image rights contract. It's mainly a performance-based contract of wearing the boots, but there may be also some personal appearances required, or you know, the use of a photograph of the player or something by the, the boot company. Can you, Amadi Dotson from Nigeria. Um, what do you do in a situation where um, the right of the image right of of a player clashes with that of the club? For instance, recently you had um, Will Rooney advertising um, a Nike shirt when he was congratulating um, what's his name, his friend Stiger on his birthday with a Nike shirt. Meanwhile, Manu was supposed to. Um, launch a kit with Adidas the next day. Will such players be penalized, or how do you go around it? Okay. There's, there's no, s uh, with, all, with all of the image rights contracts, each one is a separate negotiation. So each one will have a different, slightly twist on a fairly standard base. And when it comes to things like the sportswear, uh, things. It, it's, it's been quite a well-trodden path in terms of Adidas, Nike, Puma, all coexisting within the clubs. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, in the, they, they try and sort of keep very much in the club context, and you know, obviously you're not going to, they'll try and protect them wearing a, you know, a red Nike outfit that mirrors what he's wearing on the field or something like that. I mean, you see it more uh, of a challenge with the Nike and the Adidas piece when you're going around FIFA and UEFA when players are sort of trying to do an advertisement for a car manufacturer who's sponsoring UEFA, and they happen to be sponsored by Nike, and Nike got a contract with the individual that says he's got to be in Nike athletic gear when he's doing anything football related, and the sponsor saying we can't do that because Adidas are a sponsor of the tournament. So, you know, I think w in the club it's well trodden and it's kind of, <laughs> it's not perfect, but people protect it. I think. You know, you, you find that lower down the, 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 the pyramid of sponsors, they're a bit more relaxed. So, you know, you've got your principal partner, you've got your shirt sponsor, you've got, you know, um, training wear. You know, these guys tend to be quite well protected within image rights agreements per se, and certainly the more um, recent editions of them. But perhaps if they've got a regional banking deal with BNI in Indonesia, that's a bad example because of Barclays, but, you know, I, I they have a, a regional deal with a smaller brand in the same category, they might be more relaxed because it's only in an individual capacity. The, the player shouldn't be talking about club business and it should only be you know, his, you know, his likeness you know, outside of that. I, th I think it might perhaps comes back to a point that Fraser made earlier where the devil really is in the detail. So what yeah. does the contract precisely say? And yeah, with, with the general principle, any well principle, but custom is a player is always going to have his own boot deal. And so even if it clashes, which happens a lot with the, the, club, the club kit supplier, He'll always be permitted to have that deal, um, but the difference, is, as Andy said, it's his club deal is in a club context and his individual is in a personal context. So there's always these clashes, but it's permitted. When you mentioned Schweinsteiger, what was the Nike element of the deal? Because it's Adidas and Adidas, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, because well. Man United just introduced the Adidas shirts, haven't they? Um, Man United had launched the Adidas yeah. jersey, but not formally. They were supposed to launch it the next day. But the day before, he congratulated... But the day before, right, yeah, yes. yeah. 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 He's o if because that's in a club capacity, so he's OK with Adidas, so there's no... Yeah. Yeah. There was also an interesting photograph of Cesc Fabregas on Sport magazine in London, which is a freebie. I think it goes out in other parts of the country as well. and. 
being a Chelsea player, he's added us in, in a club context, but this photograph of Cesc on the front cover of Sport magazine showed him wearing Puma. So presumably his boot deal and everything else is with Puma. And presumably there was no problem with that. No. Yeah. No. Yet. <laughs> Any more questions? Hi, Diego Valdez from Sports Business Institute. Um, I just had a question. Um, for example, if you have a player who has uh, a personal endorsement deal with, say, a beer, a beer brand, and then all of a sudden this this player is an international player. He plays in a FIFA tournament, wins the player of, or the man of the match, sponsored by Budweiser. What can the company uh, that sponsors the player do? in that regard to protect itself so that the player does not appear, or, or I mean, I mean, he's obviously gonna have to appear with the trophy, the Budweiser trophy, so can the, can the, um, the beer brand that sponsors or that endorses, uh, or that is endorsing the, the player, can they do anything at all, or is that just par for the course? Yeah, 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 um, yeah. normally, for exact that example, so the player's got a personal deal with a beer brand. Now, he'll be able to normally be able to do Beer, beer deals on a club capacity. So if his club had a club, uh, a, a beer sponsor, then he'd be able to do that. That wouldn't conflict with his personal deal. And he should, in his contract, be able to do that. And secondly, in a national capacity, if, in, if he's playing for the national team and there's another beer sponsor involved there, he should be able to do that as well. So normally you try and ensure that he has these three different layers, national team, club, and personal. So he should be able to do that. But if he was... In the example you gave with the trophy, in a national team capacity, you want to make sure he's with at least one or two or three other players and not on his own in that promotion. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I, I was just saying that when it's the man of the match, it's typically just... Oh, the man of the match. Yeah, well, provided the, the advertisement doesn't infer that he's personally endorsing that brand. That is, I mean, it's a very fine line, I agree, but... That's the sort of protection. So if, if they use this advert globally with him saying, so-and-so supports our brand, we're very proud, you could argue he's personally endorsing it. But if it's Man of the Match by Budweiser, sponsor of the World Cup, then you could argue it, it should be okay. But there's a fine line, and that's where creative advertising comes in. And, and you can always, you know, but generally it should be okay, provided they don't insinuate that he's sponsoring their brand. Yeah? Thank you. Any more questions? Well, I think that's probably all we have time for anyway. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank you for our panelists. Thank you. Um, for their insights. Um, we're all going to be in the conference and around the conference the next few days. So if you do have any follow-up questions, please do come and seek them out. Um, but thank you all. Have a good evening.